Good afternoon, everybody. It is Tuesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, digital sports producer for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, back with our weekly a baseball show with Jason Mackey. Um, Jason, it's been a big week in Pirates land. How are you? I'm doing okay. It has been a big week. It's been a weird week, man. Uh, we were just talking off air, and it's it's crazy to think how much has changed when we last sat down here. We didn't know about the Brian Reynolds opt-out. I think we sort of thought because that's what was happening, that there was going to be a deal done and that you know there was the pathway to get a deal done. And I still think that's possible. But this opt-out thing really threw, threw the process for a loop. I'm not sure. I'm not sure people saw – sorry, I'm going on a Brian Reynolds tangent here. This is just front of brain. But um, you know, I don't know if people saw like eight years, $106.75 million. I think they probably saw it breaking down before that. But to get so close and then to have it come apart, it's just – wow. It's been, it's been a wild one chasing that stuff. Yeah, Jason, could you explain kind of where we stand with the opt-out clause at the at this hour as you understand it? Um, you know, because like you said, we haven't been able to talk about it for our YouTube audience yet. Uh, what is what is the exact latest on where things stand and, and where the two sides are? Well, just in case anybody has not grasped like what's going on here, um, the Pirates and Brian Reynolds have essentially agreed on an eight-year contract to start in 2023, paying him what I said, 106.75 million dollars. But the snag is an opt-out, um, and they want it. Reynolds camp wants it after the sixth year, or after I'm sorry, after the the fourth year, which would be 2026. Um, they have him via team control or under team control through 2025. So we can debate whether it makes sense. But basically what they want um, and where things stand is Reynolds Camp wants the ability to step back and say, am I being paid enough money right now commensurate with my talents? Are the Pirates right now in a good spot rebuilding-wise? You know, and, and they might, their contention is he might just look around and say, yeah, cool, let's keep going. I'm opting in. Um, obviously he might not, which is the sticking point. The pirates don't want a new movement clause in there. They don't want a no, or, uh, they don't want a no trade clause. They don't want an opt out. Um, the gray area is, can their minds change with an opt out, you know, that's later than the fourth year. Uh, sorry. I feel like I'm down in the weeds explaining stuff that's way too dense for the average fan. But the idea is that the opt out in this deal is really, really early, um, and I'm not sure it makes sense for the Pirates to do the deal. Can you move the opt-out back? I think that's probably your wiggle room if the Pirates are willing to do that. Right now, I have no indication that either side is engaged on that negotiation. Um, that could also be that we're shutting out the media. That's gone back and forth. Like there was a, a period after he requested the trade where they basically said, like, we're not talking to media. We're not, you know, they're very open about it. Um, and then they start leaking stuff left and right. Um, and then the Pirates get in on, and, and, you know, it's so – I don't know what strategy we're doing here. It wouldn't shock me if I got to the park today and there was a Reynolds extension. It also wouldn't shock me if they didn't agree on anything and just said the opt-out was a non-starter. So that's a whole whole mess of words to, to sort of explain where we're at. It's weird. Yeah, I think that you led in well to my next question, which is, is the is the opt-out a non-starter for the Pirates? Is there no – can you see a path to them accepting that um, you know, if, if Reynolds doesn't budge and, and, and it looks like they can't, you know, kind of get any leverage, especially because, you know, he, as of today, he has three home runs. He's tied for the, the, the major league lead. Um, he's yeah. off to a, a, a fairly hot start. So that's just ramping up the pressure on the Pirates, you know, I think a little bit more, um, you know, in terms of the leverage Reynolds is, is building for himself. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. I, to answer the first question, Adam, I don't think there's a path to get a deal done if there's an opt out in it. I just don't. Um, that's my sense of the situation, that if a deal gets done, it's going to be because Brian drops his request for an opt-out. Um, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe after pushing it after six, they might be motivated. But, I mean, I will say this about the Pirates. They seem pretty comfortable being criticized. Or, like, I don't think this is the bit of criticism that they're going to say, whoa, we got to change precedent here. You know? Like, they're sort of comfortable in their own skin. And I – they're looking, and that's not to say they're right or wrong. I'm not levying an opinion. I'm just saying that they do deal with a lot of criticism. This might lead to more, but I think by and large, people also understand where they're coming from on this, where, you know, like the positive side is, oh, we signed Brian Reynolds, eight years, $106.75 million. Okay. Think about it from a team perspective. Like you're assuming that Reynolds is going to stay healthy and that deal is going to work out for the entirety of the deal. What if it doesn't? 
you know, think about the Gregory Polanco contract when that was signed. Everybody felt great about that. The back end of it looks ridiculous. And then the Pirates got slammed. So, like, if Reynolds is going to, you know, sign this deal, the Pirates, what they're doing, they're inheriting all the risk here um, with little upside. You know, the upside is he performs well, and then he says, yeah, screw this. I want, I want out. I want more money. Which, like, I understand from Reynolds' perspective. I mean, he should be paid commensurate with his ability, certainly. But, you know, if I'm the Pirates, I'm not sure I want to do that deal. I think I'd rather, if the, if the Reynolds camp needs an opt-out in there, to me, I say, well, go go get your opt-out. Go get it somewhere else. We have you through 2025. We're going to keep you through 2025 unless my socks are blown off. By the way, O'Neill Cruz, um, how would you like to sign for $107 million? Or, you know, not exact, but, you know, you try to do that. Um so anyway, uh, that's a that's a whole long winded way again of saying that I just don't see I don't I don't see them acquiescing to it, Adam. I don't. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point about about taking on all of the risk and and kind of the chance of not getting all of the reward. Considering you know they're only really buying out one free agent year is what we're talking about here. It's three years that they already have control of them. One year of free agency. Um, you're, t- you're spending 106 million dollars on the idea that he's going to play well, and if he plays well. Well, then he has a chance to get out. I mean, there's just too many risks involved there, I think, for the Pirates. Um, Jason, do you think that the, the, the suggestion of an opt-out clause on, from the Reynolds camp is serious in terms of like – they have had to have known that the Pirates would have a problem with that. Were they serious in making that request, or do you view that as kind of a, a gambit to try to push up the money, the dollar value – and, and do you think he'd drop that opt-out request if the Pirates got to say like 120, 130 million as he was originally, um, you know, requesting? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Adam. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and talking to people about that. Here's what I think. Um, I don't think the Pirates would go up to that number. So I, I think that's probably a moot point. Um, where this opt-out came from is really strange. I guess it was never talked about until like that afternoon um it literally i don't know the exact time but you know at some point they said you know oh by the way we want this in here um and i have no doubt that was strategic and it's probably a very smart move on reynolds camp's part where you know you get the framework for all of this set up right and the pirates can sort of see the finish line like man we got a guy eight years team friendly 106.75 like our fan base is gonna be really happy about this deal and they throw in the opt-out. Um, and that that just sort of blew it up. Um, the way I had it framed to me, it's like, imagine, uh, and I can't think of the exact example, but like imagine a conversation you have, right? Where like things are going well, and then somebody brings up something that is like, you know, sort of like one of those bombs, like the whole tenor of the conversation changes. And that's the way this went down. Um, and then the deck, like things got ugly, obviously that Friday. Nobody talked that Saturday. There was sort of like a moratorium on just dealing with this at all because everybody was so blown out after Friday. Um, and I, like, I do think there have been sort of cursory conversations about what Brian wants, um, what they're going to do. I, you know, I, I, I have a tough time wrapping my head around all of this stuff, knowing Brian dealing a lot with his agency, dealing a lot with the pirates sort of being in the middle of, you know, this is what this side wants. This is what this side wants. And I mean, the way I approach this is like, I listen to both of them hopefully mix it with my own brain and analytical thought. And then that's what you read in here. Um, but like, I, is this really Brian Reynolds driving the opt-out clause? Is that really that much of a non-starter for him? I find that a little hard to believe. Like I, I know a few things about Brian Reynolds and I know that he likes comfort. He's a simple person. He doesn't want bothered with stupid questions. He really doesn't want to talk that much outside of people that he knows. Like, he'll be available, but he's not going to say anything. It's just kind of like his shtick. You know, he's a lot more interesting off the record. He's a really smart guy. He's a good family guy. I don't think he wants to put his family through, like, you know, the New York ringer or the Los Angeles ringer or something like that. Like, he legit loves Pittsburgh. Um, and is he going to be that? Is, is, is this a hill he's going to die on? I just find that hard to believe. So, like, I don't know. That's my own skepticism, and that's to say – I'm a little curious like where this opt out came from and if it's really truly a sticking point for him. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, if I was going to just speculate wildly, which is what we do on YouTube sometimes, you know, it it, it, it seems to me like he wants more money and, and that they introduced that at the last second and saying, okay, I mean, $106 million for him for that period of time seems like a kind of a bargain basement rate, right, Jason, compared to what the mar market is. And I know they've talked about, like, backloading yeah. it, so maybe you're making more at the back end. Of, but at the end of the day, if you just average out what you'd be making $100 million over eight years, I would think Brian Reynolds could get much more than that on, on the market. And then the opt-out clause is, is an instrument towards saying, yeah, I want a little bit more. Um, that, that's just kind of my read from the outside. But you obviously have a lot more on the inside. Yeah, no, I understand people's way of looking at that. I do. Um, what I don't understand, and I kind of tend to push back on, and is that like Reynolds is taking some sort of like crazy haircut on this thing. Like if you do the math, 80 million, 134 million. Like where's the midpoint there? Right about where they're at. Like I think Reynolds is Reynolds camp is given like one more million dollars than the team. Um, is that fair? I I think it's probably slanted a little toward Reynolds. Because, like if he does this deal and doesn't get a no movement clause, doesn't get an opt out clause, like you're tethering yourself to this franchise that has obviously had a, a not very good track record of success. It, it hasn't had any success outside of, you know, 13, 14, 15. So like, I get that, but it, it, why like put, put the other hat on. Why would that team do this deal? Like that, that's why, you, I would hope that if I'm going to work for somebody that they don't do a deal like this because that would screw all of us. That just would not make sense. Um, now, being open to negotiate the opt-out, I do think that should be a, a conversation topic. I think everything should be a conversation topic in this. But, you know, it, 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 it depends on – like I've asked the Reynolds camp, Adam, like how movable or fungible are you with the opt-out? And the answer is basically, well, we haven't gotten there. We haven't had that conversation. They, they're not willing to discuss it. And I get that. Um, I, I hope that it's been discussed and just not shared with me. That's entirely possible. Um, because like, if, if the opt-out was after year six, I would feel a heck of a lot differently about this deal than I would after year four. I just don't see a benefit from the Pirates. And when you have them through 2025, just keep them through 2025. Milk every last ounce of baseball you can and then trade him for prospects. Because if he opts out after 2026, guess what? You get an additional year that you pay for, but you also don't get anything in return. I, I just, and you've inherited a bunch of risk on the back end. So I, I don't get that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I it, it just, in seeing things from the outside, I said, oh, I, I don't think that, that they're coming across as particularly serious compared with what you've written and what, what he said about, I want to be in Pittsburgh. I want all that. To me, you don't do something like that at the 11th hour if you're serious. I mean, that's just kind of where I, I sit with it, but I can see different perspectives as well. Yeah, I mean, he. I think both can be true, right? Like, I think he can want to be in Pittsburgh. I think there's also another side of this business that people don't necessarily see where players are counted upon by other players and agencies to maintain precedent. Um, you know, he doesn't want to agree to a contract that looks stupid, I guess. Um, you know... I guess that's one way of saying it, but you know, is $107 million stupid? Not necessarily. You can look at some projections. I mean, you could, you could look in metrics and paint Brian Reynolds if you wanted to as one of the worst five worst outfielders in the league last year. Like those numbers aren't crap. I don't, I don't see it based on the eye test. I think it's probably somewhere between a gold glove finalist and, you know, he, he's an average outfielder. Um, you know, th this stuff is just hard to project, man. It really is. And if you want to be somewhere, um, you're going to find a way to be there, I think. And um, I, I hope they get the opt-out worked out. To me, that's the worst thing you can do in anything is just draw a hard line and say, like, we're not doing this. We need to have this. We're not willing to work. Like, look at the money. You know, like I said earlier, $80 million, $134 million. What happened? They ended up meeting in the middle. Okay, we don't want an opt-out. We want one after the fourth year. How about after the sixth year? I don't know. Maybe that maybe that spurs discussions. But I do think it would be a shame to have the discussions with Reynolds get as far as they have to tease fans the way that they have and not be able to finish it. But if it comes apart because of a, a, an opt out after 2026 and the Pirates say, look, this is not a smart deal for us, I would hope that people would at least sort of understand where they're coming from as long as that money is repurposed somewhere else.
Yeah, and and you know, Jason, I've I've always been a proponent of of spending, of of saying that you know the pirates can afford to to sign these types of deals. Um, but you know, I think taking on that risk is a smart. I think there's a difference between spending the money and and making that statement, but taking on more risk than you should. And I certainly will not be at the front of the line, you know, level leveling that criticism if if the, if the deal doesn't get done for these reasons, because um, you know, to me, this is the kind of deal you don't sign if you're a small market team. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I, that's just how I look at it is there's too much risk involved. It's not the dollars. It's, it's the kind of the mechanics of it. And that's what makes it complicated sometimes. Um, Jason, I also wanted to talk to you about Travis Williams comments that have angered a lot of fans. Um, I, yep. I think it was a couple of weeks ago at this point, but um, you know, there was a lot of conversation about it online because we were talking so much about the end of spring training last week. We didn't really get a chance to get into it. Um, basically the, the summation is, you know, Travis Williams is talking about how much better the in ballpark experience is going to be and that he sees his job as, as making, you know, PNC park a destination for people, whether or not the team is good. A lot of people took that to be an excuse for the team being bad. Mm -hmm. What was your understanding of, of those comments, you know, given that you were in the room for, for a lot of them? Yeah, that was, that was a day, wasn't it? Um, the way those things work, um, Travis wanted to do a, you know, series of interviews with the reporters covering spring training. So we started a conga line in his office. Um, I had the first one. I think it was MLB.com, DK Pittsburgh Sports and the Athletic. I want to say was how it went. Not not that it matters, but I think that Travis, over the course of those interviews, maybe like refined his answers. And, and you know, it was like a, like I, I watched sort of what the answers to my questions were became with the answers to Rob Beer Temple from The Athletic. I believe he was fourth um you know and i know that his were was you know the one that that really irritated some people where it's like you can overcome a bad game with a good fan experience or whatever and i here's what i think of travis williams and what i've seen and observed from his time covering the penguins i i think he's a good human being um and i preface that by saying like i think he's trying i think there's intent there to try to like answer a question and give fans something that they can feel good about um, and also to create an experience that they can feel good about. I also think it was misexecuted um, both on Travis's end and sort of the way he's being deployed. Um, it was a mistake to not have Travis talk to the media for two years. And I've maintained that with the pirates and that, that has created a situation like this where people are wanting to hear from the team president. And then the team president talks and says something like that. And it comes off as ridiculous. Um, it's not ridiculous if he would maintain a regular relationship with the media. If he talks to the media a couple times a year and then they happen to be announcing ballpark enhancements and Travis is saying, look, it's really important to us for people to have a good experience in the ballpark. Like we know the team is what it is. We, we but like, you know, we want people to get up to the concession stand to get down and see their and, and watch the game and not be stuck in line. And the concourse improvements matter to us. Like that's not a stupid conversation, Adam. It's just not like for the team president that's worried about a fan friendly experience. That's stuff he should be worrying about. Tout the scoreboard. Tell us all about the ballpark. Sit down and talk about how you're connecting with fans. But when you do it once every two years, that doesn't work. Like the issue with Travis's comments that I didn't like was when he started talking about like, I'm not going to be available all the time. I'm not going to be the guy that's like front and center. Guess what, dude? You're the president of the team. You need to be front and center because when you're not, it bubbles up and it turns into this. If there are regular marking points for us to ask questions of Travis, there are times to talk about baseball. There's times to talk about the direction of the on-field product. There are times to talk about getting in and out of the ballpark or charity events or all these other things. But like he refuses to talk to media at any regular clip and it creates a a pretty ugly problem and they maintain like you know travis isn't the baseball guy ben's not the baseball guy okay well then change the titles you know make charrington the president of baseball operations and make travis the president of business operations or something like that but i would still i would still caught you know it is never a bad thing to be transparent with the media and communicative with the media because that means you're being transparent and communicative with your fans when you're not it looks like you're hiding something and then it just bubbles up and I, they're not like I prefaced it by saying, I think he's a good person. I think the pirates have good people in charge here, but I think it's a sort of man-made problem that when Travis says something that it should otherwise be innocuous, it blows up on him. And then. 
Well, yeah, I, that was, I think that leads in well to what my question was, is do you think there's a confusion of roles here? And people think, people look at Travis Williams and they see the next iteration of Frank Hoonley, who was very involved in baseball, who, who was very outspoken about baseball. Um, but, but you know, I, my understanding is that that's not this relationship. Uh, I, do you think that you know, the communication that you're talking about, the lack of it, kind of helps muddle those roles for fans such that when they hear Travis Williams talking about the game experience, they hear him making excuses that he may not really be making excuses for. Exactly. Exactly. He's not making excuses. He's just talking about what how he spends his day-to-day. Like, Travis doesn't spend his day-to-day the way Frank did. You know, Frank would, like, roam the fields and talk to pitching coordinators and, you know, talk to players about baseball stuff, which was, you know, I mean, you do you, man. Like, Whatever. I mean, maybe those conversations were good and maybe the players really liked them. I don't know. But, um, you know, th- that's just not Travis. And they don't, it, that doesn't need to be Travis. Like, you should hire an entire wing of baseball people to handle the baseball. Let Travis handle the business. But I know from my perspective, and I've argued this with the Pirates, if he is the president of the team, he is accountable for things that are under him. One of the things that is under him is Ben Charrington and baseball operations. So why should we not be asking the president of the team about baseball operations? And Adam, frankly, another issue that is that has gone on here, and it, like this, this has bit the pirates in the butt too, has been Bob Nutting. And I, not a, a mark against Bob personally. I like I like dealing with Bob, but when he doesn't talk for a number of years, I think Travis feels insecure or uncomfortable talking about baseball things without Bob first addressing them. When Bob addresses things the way he did in spring training, be it Reynolds. RSNs, spending, whatever. Make yourself available to field questions. There's less pressure on Travis. Now, somebody can look at that and say, well, Bob talked and then Travis talked and things blew up on Travis. But I I still believe that if Bob is regularly answering questions about the state of the team, the direction of the team, that should free up Travis if titled differently and presented differently to talk about connection with fans, fan engagement, that sort of stuff. Jason, do you think, speaking to the, the ballpark experience, you know, kind of speaking to the comments themselves about we're, we're trying to make it a better experience, we're trying to improve this, we're trying to improve that, when fans walk through those gates on Friday for the home opener, um, is it going to be a better ballpark experience? Do you believe in that? Because I think a, a lot of fans feel like things have slipped in recent years, whether it's um, Pirate Fest as an example, the yep. Pirate Fest going away, the out-of-town scoreboard going away to make it advertising space on the Clemente Wall. There have been me personally, when I've been in that ballpark in the last five years, the lines are longer than they've ever been outside. They're longer than they've ever been inside. Um, yep. There's there's concession booths that straight up aren't staffed. And, and I think that's, you know, it, in it, partly a result of the pandemic, but also some of those issues predated the pandemic. Do you think that there's a serious commitment here to, to getting PNC Park back to the way it was when it opened and it was the best ballpark in baseball, in my opinion, and not just the best view in baseball? Right, right. And I know what you mean, Adam. Uh, the past couple of years, I, I don't know, it probably isn't intentional, but I mean, the Pirates have kind of been passed by with some other ballparks and the way they're doing things. And like I go to ballparks for a living, um, walking through Boston. This is just a, a small thing. Like there are some places where I have to go and take out my bag and, and put things in a tray and they search your bag and all this stuff. Well, the, the, there are other ballparks that you go through that you just walk through technology it scans your stuff whatever the pirates just went from one to the other like they just went from the you can just walk through to i'm going to stop and search and take time that's what delays lines getting into the park and like you know wrigley has the same thing and i'm sure there are other ones but just top of brain for me or fenway and and wrigley like there aren't as many lines getting into those places because they streamline the process and that's what the pirates have done Um, walk around ppg paints arena and look at some of the the offerings on like the 100 level, they have a lot of what P, uh, PNC Park is going to right now. The like do it yourself, kiosk, grab and go, beer market kind of things. Um, and that's what they should be doing. That is the case all around, um, you know, professional sports arenas. That's the norm. And the Pirates have been behind the times with that stuff. So, like, in a way, I give Travis Williams a lot of credit for pulling the Pirates into an era where they should be. It's just, you know, people want answers on three consecutive 100 lost seasons from the president of the team. And they're pissed. And I don't blame them for feeling that way. Like they deserve that communication. Um, But yes, I do see it being a better experience, Adam. I I think they vastly underestimated. And maybe this is part of Travis being a, 
you know, not baseball guy at heart. Like he didn't realize what the out of town scoreboard means. Like, I don't care what check you're going to get for that advertising space. Baseball people really care. Like you think you're going to take that stuff away at Wrigley or Fenway and, and that's going to last more than a day without a mutiny. I mean, come on, you want to be a real baseball play. You, you, you want to see a quality place to see a baseball game that came out better in my head than it did in my mouth. But, um, Keep the out of town scoreboard. Fix the fix the uh, jumbotron or big screen, which they did. Thankfully, um, you know, Pirate Fest. I could go on a whole separate podcast rant about that, but like, you know, season ticket holders aren't the only people that matter, man. There are casual fans. There are people that watch your games. There are people that buy your product that generate excitement. Just log on to Twitter, man. There's a lot of people on. Not that it's real life, but like, there's a lot of people on there that spend a lot of time engaging in coverage of your team, even, you know, like blogs, fan level coverage, like those people matter, man. Don't, don't shut them out. If you want to do something separate to prioritize season ticket holders, great. But like, don't shut the rest of them out because they matter probably just as much as season ticket holders, just in a different way. Like the season ticket holders might, you know, fund you financially, but those other people are drumming up interest in getting people talking about your product. Jason, just to put a, a button on this conversation, I, I think the thing personally that, that galled me about the comments that, that Travis Williams made is, is it, it, it kind of speaks to what I kind of feel like is the um, the perspective of ownership of we're not selling winning here, we're selling baseball. Uh, and, and we're selling Americana and the experience and, and that's what the Pirates are for and it's not necessarily winning. To what extent do you think that that's a, a fair criticism of – their perspective from an ownership management front office perspective. I think it's a completely fair criticism, Adam. I do. I don't have any problem with it. I, I think people, you know what I think the crime is here? Just not leveling with people more. Um, I'm okay with that being an ingredient in the conversation. Like, well, I shouldn't say it like that. Um, like if you're selling the experience, you're selling Americana, you're selling baseball, fine. You know what you should also be selling? Come along for the journey the rebuild. This is what we're doing. And not use the word rebuild saying like, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. They like to talk a lot about, you know, we're being transparent with this transparent with that. They're really not. I mean, I like dealing with Derek Shelton. I like covering Derek Shelton, but you know, he's not exactly the most transparent manager you're going to find. You know, Ben Charrington is not exactly the most transparent general manager you're going to find. And that doesn't matter. Like they need to do their job. Well, I don't care if they're, you know, good quotes, I can do my job without it. But like, you know, what I think would be better is if they were just like super open and honest about what they were doing and how they were doing it and how they saw things and what they needed to do for the build. And I get that you kind of can't say that you can't say that you're tanking or you can't say that like the goal isn't winning this year. The goal is to have a good ballpark experience because then you get crushed the way Travis Williams did in spring training. But I feel like there's a little bit more of an open communication they could have with fans. And so like if you're selling the ballpark previously and it's not played up winning so much, like fans already understand that they should understand that. Um, And then when you turn a corner a little bit, like I believe they will this year, you start to sell winning more. You start to sell the experience less. It should be less about baseball and Americana and more about, Hey, come see, you know, Mitch Keller, come see O'Neill Cruz, come see Rowanzi, you know, whatever. And they can start to sell those stuff. They have guys that you want to actually come out and see play. But to me, it was just like uh, people get insulted that they're selling this Americana stuff where, you know, they're, they're sort of like not explicitly saying the other part, but you have, you know, people are inferring about the, uh, I don't know, the messaging or whatever that they don't care about winning. They do, which is different. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the the kind of pivot. Are they going to make that pivot is my question, or is it just a permanent state of when the rubber meets the road and when, when the, you know, this rebuild gets to a state where they've got to make some commitments to keep it going or to make it really work, are they, or are they going to do that or do they see their role as, oh, we're just going to go back to selling the ballpark? I sure as heck hope they do. <laughs> if not, what the heck are, what are we doing here? Well, I think um, that's a valid question, though, don't you? Like, so I, I feel like the last – decade of Pirates baseball since that winning. I mean, that I think that's a valid question. I do too. I'm, I do too. I'm not arguing with the question. I just think that like they better, 
you're asking for fans patience and you're asking for them to buy in. And you know what, in their defense, Adam, like offering a guy an eight year, $106.7 million, $75 million contract. Like that, that is that that's making the pivot when the rubber meets the road. And if that clamp is insistent on an opt out after the fourth year, okay, that's, that's not bad business. I don't have any problem with that. I'm completely fine with the pirates being willing to go to offer that contract, but not with the opt out. Um, do I think they need to be, you know, handed a parade and, you know, presented as some like model model of spending. No, of course not. Like you, they have a long way to go, but you know, they've done what, what they have said they need to do get more talent. They have more talent. Um, they spent more this off season. They said they were going to, you know, be better. They should be held to a different standard this year. I think they need to be held to a standard of, Retaining their best players. Brian Reynolds would be one. Keep Brian Hayes, Mitch, Bednar, Cruz, whomever. You know, they they like they can't be a continuous cycle. But, you know, do they turn the corner? Like, I think they will. I, I don't think that – put it this way. Travis Williams and Ben Charrington didn't have to come here. Uh, they wanted to come here based on what they heard the vision was. I wish we knew a little bit more about the bit, vision, but I think we can all – you know, I think we know enough – to, to at least I do like I do think that spending is going to be different more um, and that if they don't win I'm not guaranteeing they win but it you know they should have enough here to compete Jason kind of light on baseball conversation in in this podcast YouTube show because I think I mean these were important topics to talk about but just to re- kind of wrap things up first four games it's very small sample size but what's kind of played out the way you expected what maybe hasn't um so far yeah um it, it's all it's tough with this few data points but um like i thought jack sawinski had kind of a rough red series i liked what i saw from last night from him last night i uh, thought he was a lot better I, I don't know why that was front of brain but it was um before the reynolds dropped fly ball i thought the defense has actually been pretty good um bullpen was serviceable um I've liked basically what I've seen there. Um, Zestrizny, Moretta, they've been pretty good. Underwood, Holder, Holderman, uh, Bednar has been solid. Um, the offense has been quieter maybe than I, I would have expected, at least going into last night. Um, but the Reds have pretty good big three there in their rotation. Sorry, I'm dancing all around here with just random stray thoughts. Um, what else? What else? What else? The pitching's been so-so. Like, I like the way Oviedo sort of shut it down and, and – was able to almost get through five. I thought that was important. But if you look at basically the the whole first trip through the rotation, like they they want to need more from those guys. I, I think that's a fair ask. Um, I've liked what I've seen from McCutcheon. He looks like he can absolutely play. Um, I didn't really doubt it, but we've seen it play out. Um, I don't understand what they have going on with Choi, Santana, Kutch, um, even Connor Joe. Like there's too many cooks in the kitchen right now. We've talked on here. Um, I know I got blasted on Twitter for even suggesting this. And now I look at the G-Man Choi thing and think like, wh- why? Why? $4.6 million for a bench player and occasional DH. And, and you you could use that spot on like somebody else in AAA who performs. Like I just, I don't get that. He's not given the opportunities to do what you want to happen here. Like play enough to get hot and make himself tradable. Um, so I, I don't understand that, but you also have to play like McCutcheon's deserve the right to play. Carlos Santana should probably play. I liked what he's, he's done so far. He's the better defensive first baseman. I just don't understand what they have going there. Well, Jason, I'm, I'm glad we got the 30,000 foot view from you. We'll get into more baseball talk next week, hopefully, unless there's another, another turn in the, in the Brian Reynolds saga. But, um, thanks for hopping on today. I think these were really, you know, important conversations to have. Likewise, man. Thanks for bringing it up. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. If you're uh, just joining us for the first time, just a reminder, please pop a like on this video. Help us out with the YouTube algorithm. Please make sure you're subscribed. Plenty more uh, baseball talk, football talk, hockey talk on the channel this week with uh, Christopher Carter on the North Shore Drive. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And please make sure you check out the subscription deal down in the description. uh, $6 for six months of access to post-gazette.com. That's everything uh, Jason's writing, everything I'm writing, everything all of our Steelers reporters are writing in the lead up to the draft. Uh, great deal. What one dollar uh, per month? You, you can't beat it. So uh, make sure you check that all out. And, and thanks for joining us today. We'll be back next week. 
Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description.